welcome my 60 subscribers, everyone on Wrestling Reddit, and all of you who are bigger embarrassments to your families than your scrub loser brothers. Welcome to my review of AEW Dynamite for the July 6, 2022 episode. Let's begin. So the show is opened by Wardlow versus Scorpio Sky for the TNT Championship. And when someone says street fight, you would expect weapons, you would expect more violence. But this was just a normal match. A very normal match where there was a lot of nothing happening. The stipulation was only used for some very minor involvement by American Top Team. They weren't very effective. And a hit with the TNT title. Honestly, I can't even think of any spots of the match for this one. Everything was like pretty slow and pretty basic. Except the end where we finally get Wardlow's big moves as well as some big interferences by American Top Team. And they get destroyed. Some MMA fighters were destroyed by a professional wrestler. And it wasn't even close. I think Wardlow is being made to look too strong. And I feel like he should be struggling against, like, actual trained MMA fighters. And he shouldn't just be, like, taking out these guys like the security guards that he did for, like, multiple weeks. So this was basically just, like, passing the belt to Wardlow, basically. A very boring start. The ending got a pop, but it was more because of Wardlow's overness than the match being good. I don't know if Scorp is injured, but it seems like he was minimizing his like movements here. We really don't get to see a lot from Sky, and yeah, this wasn't a good match for me. And so the feud just ends there. I think this should have been prolonged somehow. Maybe we'll get Ethan Page. But yeah, no spots of the match. Uh, this is like an undercard to a normal show, a minor show, a TV show. Not very good. Let's move on. So after this is a promo by John Moxley. I think this is his permanent position now because we always get a Moxley promo as the second segment for like a couple of weeks now. So yeah, Moxley cuts a promo against Brody King and the man knows what he's doing. He is true to his character and he cuts his usual promo, which is really good. And as for the content of his promo, uh, he puts over himself, he puts over Brody King, he puts over BCC, and he hypes up their match for later. Uh, he sort of does all the things he needs to do in this promo, and it's really good. So yeah, nice segment. It's the usual John Moxley segment we get every week. And yeah, he is very consistent with it. He successfully sold me on the match later, the main event. So after this, we have a backstage segment by Mark Sterling and Tony Nese with Keith Lee. And this is sort of a recurring thing where Mark and Tony are trying to get Swerve Strickland fired. And I don't know why. I don't remember how this all happened. But it's a nice lower card storyline to build up a feud between Tony Nese and Swerve. So yeah, that's pretty good. And Mark Sterling has always been funny. I thought he was the best part of the Wardlow versus the security guards feud. So yeah, he starts off with Keith Lee. But Keith, just because they're winning, sort of overlooks Swerve's betrayal in the Battle Royal. And yeah, someone who lacks charisma, like Tony Nese, looks really good with someone with like overloading charisma like Mark Sterling. So yeah. I'm very interested in the payoff to this People Against Swerve Strickland storyline. So after this is the Christian Cage segment where he enters with Luchasaurus. There are shades of Christian and Tyson Tomko and I kind of wish he shows up just so Christian can like flex his asshole muscles because that's his new character. He's an asshole who tells truths and I know a lot of people like him. So he makes an intro before he shit talks Jungle Boy some more. And he's interrupted by Matt Hardy. And basically Matt is only brought out here just to get destroyed. 
especially with what happened to Jeff. Because Christian just invokes Jeff's name, insults Matt with it, and then Matt just can't say anything else. He can't come up with like a witty retort or anything. He just moves on and then talks about how he used Butcher and the Blade and Private Party in that shitty faction. And then Christian Cage, who I think is the most entertaining like non-wrestling segment dude in the roster right now. I mean, I think this guy is about to win multiple non-wrestling segment of the week awards for me. Because he just like adds to this by incorporating the broken universe says that he used everyone to gain clout like in that whole program. So it gets kind of jokey, but then he goes back to Jeff and then says that Matt is using him for their last run, for some clout, instead of giving Jeff help. And holy shit, knowing that Jeff is finally getting help, I think it's okay to use this now and fuck. He got all of the crowd on their feet, like they're listening intently to this guy. Heel Christian is like next level right now. The dude has taken MJF's spot. And when MJF comes back, I can't wait for Turtleneck versus Scarf. And so, as we expect from the start of this, he uses Luchasaurus to kick Matt's ass. Christian doesn't even lift a finger. He just plays defense for like a couple of seconds and then Luchasaurus just destroys Matt Hardy. Great segment. Very likely candidate for segment of the night. And yeah, love Christian Cage, love this new gimmick. I can't wait for either MJF or Jungle Boy to return. Just to see how they'll interact with this new Christian Cage. So after this, we get a recap of Blood and Guts. And then we have a backstage segment. It's a sort of like a parking lot interview with Tony Schiavone, Claudio Castagnoli, and Jake Hager. And Jake starts this off by trashing Claudio that he's never won a world championship in Ring of Honor and in the WWE. And of course, when he name-dropped the E, he got a big response. And yeah, that's kind of a big mark on Claudio. I'm checking his Wikipedia page and I'm seeing that he's won a world championship. No, no. He hasn't won a lot of world championships. He has in Europe and in PWG, but in the other promotions like in Chikara, he hasn't really been world champion a lot. While Jake is like a multiple-time WWE champion. So yeah, great sticking point here for Jake. But then Claudio uh, does not dwell on the past. He stays right here in the present and then cites his perfect record in like very difficult matches to set up his match with Jake on Fighter Fest next week. So we get another special event two weeks after the previous one. But yeah, it's, it's a Claudio's next match. It's going to be, I think, really good because these two know each other. They both cut decent promos, and yeah, I'm like moderately hyped for the match. Even if it's a foregone conclusion, Claudio's gonna win, and is gonna be used as like another stepping stone for Claudio's push. So yeah, decent backstage segment. I wonder if they'll actually pay it off with a Claudio championship win, but yeah, it's I. So after this, after a lot of talking segments, we finally get match number two, which is Swerve in Our Glory. So that's Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland against The Butcher and The Blade and The Bunny. So this match is a tale of two halves. So the first half is very sloppy and botch-filled because we get a botch by Swerve where he fails to do a leapfrog. And then again, when he sort of oversells like an apron leg sweep by The Blade... And then he like totally falls on his face. I don't think it's like completely a botch, but the commentators did not do well to hide this. Taz mentioned a mishap, but he sort of like swerves and then changes it up to like a mishap that Blade contributed to, but it wasn't very convincing. And the camera angle really didn't help. And the first half of the match was just like very slow. The bunny, though, was 
pretty good at ringside. But the match started to pick up when Swerve tags in Keith. Uh, they do some combination moves. And then we get one of the spots of the match, which is like this miscommunication where Keith just like shoulder blocks the shit out of Swerve. And this makes him bounce off like the top rope and then to the ground. This looked really good. And I like the Butcher and the Blades tag team moves. Conceptually and theoretically, what they're trying to go for looks really cool, but in practice, they need to practice it more. They actually do like a candidate for spots of the match, and I'm gonna describe that later. And then the last candidate for spots in the match, I really like this part. It's a nice piece of storytelling. It resolves the previous miscommunication and it gets these guys on the same page. Keith like tries to save Swerve by attacking the Blade who's attacking Swerve. But then he accidentally almost knocks off Swerve off like the top turnbuckle. And then Keith grabs him by the wrist, saves his ass from falling over the turnbuckle to the outside. And then they do a fist bump which gets us back to status quo. Or so we think. This could play out in many different ways after a match that is set up after this. So yeah, after this save spot, they do their finisher. It doesn't look the best because it doesn't look like Swerve is actually stepping on the opponent. Like again, in theory, this would look really cool if you could actually do this without killing someone. But yeah, as it is right now, I think they should change this. If a move looks too dangerous to do effectively and to make it look at least halfway decent and believable, you shouldn't be doing that move. You should be looking for something else that could look cool and believable at the same time and not just in theory. So yeah, for the spots of the match, number three is that tag team move by The Butcher and the Blade where The Butcher throws Swerve like from the turnbuckle to the blade's knee. And I think if you give these guys more time, give them a push, and if they work on a lot more tag team moves, they would be like in championship contention for me. Like they would actually deserve to be in that category of tag teams. And the number two spot is the miscommunication spot where Keith knocks the shit out of Swerve, making him bounce from the rope to the ground. And then for the top spot in the match, I like how they close out the story where Keith saves Swerve and then they're all good. Crisis averted, their relationship is saved for now. So yeah, this was a decent match. It was like a minor show, TV show, undercard quality. And it belongs right where it is. And so after the match, we get the setup for the match next week. And oh my god, I love Starks and Hobbs. They're both amazing on the mic, but Rick Starks is just like next level. I'm just gonna show you a picture of Rick Starks absolutely going insane. He was about to pop a blood vessel. He was about to do like an Emperor Valentinian. I think we have it right here. If MJF does decide to leave, I think Starks is the one. He can be all cool and stuff, and he can go all red-faced and intense. Starks is the one. He spouts out some stuff about them being disrespected and that they're the best tag team and then the best tag team's music plays and then they come out. And it's the Young Bucks and they are like concretely with proof the best tag team in AEW because they're the champs. And then shit, just like what they say in their book, the Young Bucks play up their heelishness, especially when they're the heels right now and I think in most of their runs and then they play up what people criticize them of and in this case they like play up the Meltzer stars they play up that they founded the company they big time everyone and shit this works so much and then to put the cherry on top they flex that they beat the team that beat these two teams in double or nothing so yeah and then they set up the match by them being the heels, setting up a three-way tag team match. And this feels weird because, like, as heels, like, usually, 
you're like chicken shits, you don't want to have matches, you will find the best advantage you can. But I love that the Bucks subvert expectations and they set the match up themselves. So none of the two teams in the ring and on the ramp have a chance to reply. And then the fucking crowd just yell out FTR, but the Young Bucks shut it down. Oh my god, at the next pay-per-view, we're gonna get it, we're gonna get FTR versus the Young Bucks, and it's gonna be glorious. Or who knows, maybe like two pay-per-views after. But whatever happens, it's gonna be fucking awesome. So yeah, I've never seen the Bucks interact with any of these guys, ever. Even with Starks and Hobbs, who've been here since the start. So yeah, I'm interested in how this dynamic works, I'm interested in seeing these guys wrestle. And yeah, next week is going to be awesome. And so after this, we get a very short like promo by Malachi Black hyping up Brody King. And I think this is a missed opportunity to have Brody King talk. I mean, it's his match. And Malachi isn't even in the rankings. So it will take a long time before you can set up a match between them, between him and Mox. He isn't built strong enough yet. And yeah, I don't know about this. But as usual... Malachi is really good on the mic, and Brody King looks really menacing, so this works. It builds up for the main event, and it does it well. And so after this, we get a promo segment by Eddie Kingston in the ring with Tony Schiavone. So Eddie enters the ring, he favors his back, he congratulates Wardlow and everyone in the Blood and Guts match, even Claudio. Eddie Kingston says he's grown up. But then he swerves us all by doing this. Staying true to his very like street-like thuggy character. This made me chuckle a bit and I like how the storyline between him and Claudio is still not fully resolved. Even if they finally celebrated together. And then he goes off on Chris Jericho and then he hints to a first blood match. Like a hardcore match of some sort, 1v1. But then we get Chris Jericho backstage with JAS where they injure Ruby Soho's arm by like slamming it with a car door. And I love how Ruby sells this. She's the best seller in the women's division and again this proves it. This also sets up a match between her and Ty Conti. And I fucking love how JAS, especially Daniel Garcia, who steps over Ruby and then Ange who just like dusts off his shoes, effectively kicking dirt on her face. And I love how this adds to their character, and it's pretty funny. JAS are just like a faction of assholes, and I love it. So after this, we get a weird segment. It's a proclamation of the remaining members of Dark Order that they're here to stay. So number 10, negative 1, Evil Uno, Alex Reynolds... John Silver, and Anna Jay. And I think if there was anywhere you could do this, it would be in Brody Lee's hometown. But I kind of don't know because they're basically starting a feud with a faction that I'm going to talk about later that is stuck on Dark and in the pre-shows of pay-per-views and that faction is The Factory. So QT Marshall from The Factory... Someone who's been, like, embarrassed by the Dark Order and Negative One in the past. And I think he is feuding with Negative One, actually. And it's all going to culminate when Negative One is ready to wrestle. He's going to be beating QT Marshall someday. They're going to be having a proper feud, a proper match. But that's going to take a couple of years. So yeah, QT Marshall tries his best. To not offend the memory of Brody Lee while insulting Negative One as much as he can. It's very, very softball stuff. But then Hangman Page enters and then they kick his ass. Page and all of the five members of the Dark Order beat the shit out of QT. Anna J is just there to watch. And side note, I really like how fast... John Silver and Alex Reynolds are. They should be in tag team matches on Dynamite or Rampage like a lot more regularly. 
So yeah, I don't know what this is trying to achieve aside from like a hometown pop for negative one. Maybe we're gonna get like a multi-man match with the factory, who knows? But I don't really think you can revive or like resuscitate the Dark Order without turning them heel. Or like giving them a new leader. Like Wyatt Six or something. Yeah, I really think that Wyndham Rotunda or Bray Wyatt, as we all know him, should take over the Dark Order and just revamp the shit out of it. I think he is what a dead faction like the Dark Order need to bring it back from the dead, basically. I mean, he is Brody Lee's friend. He was his former boss. And just think of the storylines we can get with him the other members of the Dark Order, and Hangman Page. It would elevate everyone. And yeah, that's my wish. I hope AEW managed to land Bray and fuck, just just like imagine the shit that can happen with Bray as the leader of Dark Order. Because they haven't been relevant since like Brody Lee. They haven't been on TV as a faction for a long time. And all we really get on TV is Hangman, of course, and John Silver. They were awesome during the Battle Royal, but that was pretty much it. You really need to give this faction a new lease on life. Give them something so that they can be interesting again. And that thing is Bray. Okay, so second hour of Dynamite, and then we get Jim Ross. So I haven't really mentioned this for the last couple of weeks, but they started doing this thing where Jim Ross enters on like the latter half of pay-per-views and at the second hour of Dynamite. And yeah, I think this is good for someone who is, I don't know, like 70 years old, like Jim Ross. It's nice that they're finally like pulling back his duties because the longer Jim Ross is out there the more tired he gets he loses focus he becomes quiet for a lot of the matches he buries the company and yeah i think this really helps a lot and then we get to the match that opens the second hour and it is penta versus roosh and i fucking love penta's entrance it's really cool and i think he should be in an upward trend whenever he has this entrance he should be winning more But yeah, he changed his entrance during a really bad time, where he's basically a jobber to the stars. So from the start of the match, you could feel it. You could feel that this was going to be match of the night because these are longtime rivals here. They know each other very well. They've worked each other in the past multiple times. And then they start off the match with some slaps. But then we get to the storytelling part where Roosh... Like everyone else, I think, in the AEW roster, try to take off Penta's mask because he's the one who, like, loses it a lot. I think everyone has seen Penta's face by now. Dude just keeps getting unmasked. Dude should know this by now and he should, like, tie it up extra hard or maybe, like, use, like, chains or something. I don't know. But that's the story of the match. And the match significantly picks up after like an outside dive by Penta that somehow leads to a fight between the two managers, the two nerds, Alex Abrantes and Jose, and they take it to the locker room. But yeah, this match just goes up a gear. We get a sequence of moves that individually could be candidates for spots of the match but i'll get to that later we get a lot of working on penta's mask to the point where it actually comes off after like headbutts and this is like automatically in the top three we get a nice backstabber by penta but this looks a bit janky and repetitive since he already did a backstabber earlier on in the match. So yeah, time to get to the top three spots of the match. So number three spot is like the first backstabber by Penta on Roosh. And then he prepares to do a running move, but then is power slammed by Roosh. 
this here looks very fluid and if they maintained a pace like this this would have been like pay-per-view quality match but i don't think it is so yeah number two spot is the finish where penta hits like a cutter and then his finisher the cero miedo i think i forgot what his finisher is called but yeah his pile driver he hits it and then he almost gets Roosh. This is a nice way to protect Fenix. But Andrade puts Roosh's leg on the rope, saving Roosh from a loss at his debut. But then the ending of the match comes shortly and it sort of ruins it because the ending is a bit bad. It's just like pulling Penta's mask off just like what the Young Bucks do. Just pinning Penta. Penta is like 100% helpless and will go down at 3 if you pull out his mask. So I didn't like this ending. Especially if you don't do a big move on him right after you pull the mask. Because it's his biggest weakness, he falls for this every time and I think it's time for a change. And then for the number 1 spot of the match is the headbutt that they both hit on each other. Although it doesn't look like they hit heads, they hit each other's shoulders. But there's this one where Penta's mask falls off and then he immediately puts it back on. So yeah, this spot popped the crowd the most and I think it's the coolest and it looks the most spontaneous. So yeah, that's my number one spot of the match. So I've already described the finish, so I didn't think it was that good and... It just brings this match down from being a pay-per-view undercard match to just like a TV main event, a minor show main event type of match. So yeah, they did well to protect Penta, but do you really need to protect Penta? I mean, against Roosh? Against a former two-time world champion? I think not. He could have just hit his finisher on Penta and won the match right there. But yeah, th this is what we get and it's pretty meh. So I think this is going to lead to a tag team match between... Uh, Los Ingobernables against the Lucha Bros. That's going to be good as long as Andrade wins. He has to. His boy is finally in the roster and I think he should be higher up on the card. And this is his ticket up. So after this is the worst Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satnam Singh like, backstage promo ever that I've seen. Satnam said too little, I think. Sanjay Dutt was good as usual. Jay, the way he delivers is really good. But this joke, this like zinger that he delivers against Samoa Joe is really fucking bad. I think he says something along the lines of, We won't take you lightly, but we'll take your championship. And my god, that's so fucking corny. Bad segment. <laughs> Again, the worst segment of these three. And it's pretty sad that it's the one that's going to culminate to the match at Death Before Dishonor. So after this, we get the continuation to the ongoing thing by Mark Sterling, where he tries to get Swerve Strickland out of the roster. And this time, he targets Orange Cassidy and the best friends. And it's just weird hearing Orange talk. It sounds like such like a normal voice, and it sounds like overly mic'd up that it's super loud and it's super prominent so whenever orange talks i guess he's just overly mic'd up his voice just takes over everything so mark sterling tries to get orange to sign but then orange says with his oddly overly mic'd voice that he won't sign it without his lawyer there and then his lawyer turns out to be danhausen who steals Mark Sterling's idea to have Tony Nese wrestle Orange on Rampage. And yeah, that's pretty funny. Best friends really don't do a lot here. They're just like window dressing and stuff. They're, they're in the background. But I'm so excited in the match we'll get between Tony Nese and Orange Cassidy on Rampage. Because these two are high flyers and it's going to be fucking crazy. We might even get some Mark Sterling shenanigans with Best Friends and with Danhausen. Danhausen is just going to torment this dude for the rest of his AEW career. And I'm all for it. So yeah. And then after this, we get the Gun Club 
slash the ass boys. But I think after what happened tonight, they're officially the gun club now. They are definitively the gun club with the acclaimed against Fuego del Sol, Ruffin It, composed of Leon Rush and Bear Country, who are composed of Bear Boulder and Bear Bronson. That was a lot of levels, but this was pretty much a squash. Leon Ruff and Bear Boulder weren't tagged in, so I don't know how this works. I think wrestlers usually get pissed off if they don't get tagged in. But this was pretty much a squash where the acclaimed did all of the damage. They did all of the work. But Austin Gunn tags himself in and then gets the pin victory. So there was a lot of storytelling here. From the start where they come in, just about when Max Caster starts to do his rap, fucking Austin Gunn just slaps the mic away. From this point on, you will realize that these two teams aren't on the same page. They will never be on the same page again. And the breakup is probably going to happen tonight. And it does. So right after the gun club get the win, the acclaimed are all pissy. They stole the win. And the guns start throwing hands. They beat the shit out of the acclaimed, effectively turning them heel. And then Billy Gunn comes in for the save. It looks like he sides with the acclaimed. It looks like he's about to discipline his sons. But blood is thicker than water. And then Billy Gunn just betrays the acclaimed. He attacks Max Caster. And then when Anthony Bowens goes for the scissors, he tries to call for the scissors with daddy ass. Like desperately. Like with forlorn hope. He tries to salvage the partnership, but Billy Ass just, like, attacks him. He throws him out of the ring. And, yeah, acclaimed officially babyfaces. Gun Club officially heals. This is further cemented when Austin Gunn scissors a downed Max Caster. And that sounds very wrong. But, yeah, great storytelling here. This feud has been gold from the start. I mean, not feud. Program. This program has been gold from the start, and I love how they paid off with a nice betrayal where, where basically everything gets torn apart from the scissoring, from the raps, to the scissor me daddy ass. That's all gone. We now go to the next stage of the feud, and it's going to be the acclaimed against the gun club who were very low on the card and were basically jobbers especially the gun club but because of a comedy program they managed to get themselves over and have people invested in them this is what every wrestler in that locker room should look to achieve so yeah the match was a nothing match but the storytelling that came after the non-wrestling part really good and so after this, we get a short video promo by Miro. This is addressed to Malachi Black. And of course, this is Miro we're talking about. Fucking great promo. He's a dude with a pretty thick accent, but he manages to make it fit with his character. And he delivers it very well. He also uses nice flowery words. He has nice diction and like prose to what he's saying it's like it should be on a book or something so yeah great promo by Miro this is so far the number two best non-wrestling segment of this entire show so the next match is a tag team match between Thunderstorm or Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm versus Nyla Rose and Marina Shafir and as usual, Marina Shafir needs more reps, but she's doing a lot better. She did a nice, like, pump handle throw. But I think if she did a pump handle slam or a pump handle drop, it would have looked better. But there was just one part where Tony tried to do a Hurricane Rana on Shafir, but then she landed in an awkward way. She did a good job getting beaten up and being the weaker member of her team. She took the beating from Thunderstorm very well. So for most of the match, this was actually weird because 
The baby faces this time cut the ring in half. They isolated Marina Shafir from Nyla Rose. And eventually, when the hot tag happened, this was pretty cool because the way Shafir tagged in Nyla was an umbrella shot. Because they brought in umbrellas during their entrances because they're facing against Thunderstorm. So, do you get it? And yeah, this might be one of my two spots of the match. And yeah, for me, Nyla Rose carried her team. She was the more entertaining performer, while Marina Shafir was just there to get beaten up. And as for the team of Thunderstorm, if there were women's tag team championships, they would be nice champions because they work well together. Like, they flowed well in what they wanted to do. Their tag team moves were pretty good. And, like, upon tagging in, they were already ready to do something. This was, like, a true tag team match and not, like, a PWG spot fest. And I think if people reacted more to this match, it would have been better. But all I can say is that it's the best match so far, and that's not saying a lot. So, for my two spots of the match... Number two is how Marina Shafir managed to get the tag in. She like hulked up, beat the shit out of Rosa and Storm, and then we get like the umbrella shot and then attack. And I liked how Marina just pulled Tony to the corner. And then for the number one spot in the match, it has to be the finish when Tony Storm went for a running hip attack on Marina while she's like seated on the lowest turnbuckle and then this sets up for a spike fire thunder driver and yeah even if this is just another spike move it's still like thunder rose's finisher and i don't see how you can add anything else to that as long as you set it up with a running hip attack it's it's fine it's a whole lot hell better than keith lee and sort of scott's finisher because that's just fucking terrible it's just like a power bomb that's supported by Swerve. He doesn't really get that double foot stomp in. And yeah, it's like so inferior compared to this. And as for the match rating, this is like just a normal show undercard match, but it's a lot better than everything we had before this. Like as a match, because I don't count the Ass Boys versus the Jobbers. <laughs> To be like a proper match. That was more of a story setup thing. So yeah, let's move on. And then after this, we get the weekly Jade Cargill promo. And it starts with the cut the shit thing. It's getting old now if you use it too much. And she's got past the point by so much in using her catchphrase. It's not even appropriate. And this whole thing is kind of pointless because... I mean... Why not accept the free help? I mean, it, it's it's not free, but you're getting numbers over your opponents. Like, Layla Gray, the person you beat in a match, is willing to submit to your dominance despite the fact that you beat her in a match. I don't understand this storyline anymore. Just, just, like, give us the payoff or something. Because we all know, like, these baddies are not gonna beat fucking Athena and Chris Statlander. Layla Gray is basically just cannon fodder, as well as Kira Hogan, and Red Velvet not so much. So yeah, after this, we have the final non-wrestling segment of the show. Before the main event, we have Daniel Garcia challenging Wheeler Yuta for the ROH Peer Championship. And Daniel Garcia is a pretty good promo if he wasn't part of JAS, because... The promo he cuts here is, like, too serious, and I think it doesn't suit their character of being sports entertainers. I mean, it's not like Daddy Magic and Cool Hand Ange, and especially not like Chris Jericho or Sammy Guevara and Tay Conti. Jake Hager, he, he doesn't talk, so... <laughs> but he does have that pretty funny lisp that he has. But yeah... All of them sound like entertainers, while Daniel Garcia kind of suits BCC more. He just sounds like a normal dude, a normal tough guy, cutting a promo on another tough guy. So yeah, really good promo, but doesn't suit the gimmick and the faction. Okay, so my mistake, that wasn't the last non-wrestling segment of the match, because this one is. It's like a promo by FTR challenging the briscoes for the titles and 
I don't think the Briscoes are going to win it. I think FTR are going to have four sets of tag team titles on them. And that has to happen before they drop any of the belts. Or else, even if they work with New Japan, they work with AAA, their value will be diminished. So it's better to have the belts on them until that point. But as for the promo, it's fine. It's like an FTR promo, the straight man promo. Straight to the point, no bullshit. And yeah, it uh, suits FTR's character. So after this, we have the main event, and it's for the interim AEW Championship. And it's John Moxley, the champion, against Brody King, the challenger. So this match starts out as a brawl. Uh, they start in the ring, and then they fight outside. And then we get a candidate for a spot of the match. It's where Moxley does like a Russian leg sweep on uh, Brody King to the guardrail. This looks sick. And it actually looks believable. Okay, so this is a match of two halves, as usual. So for the first half, Brody King is in control. They brawl all over the ring, all over the outside. It's all pretty slow here. Mox does work on Brody's leg for like a couple of minutes, but it doesn't really lead to anything because it doesn't play into the ending. And Brody doesn't sell it like after this part here. And for the second half of the match, uh, this happens when Mox gains some ground. He gains some control, but not full control. It's always established that Brody King's size is sort of too much for Mox, so that's why I really like how Brody King was like protected for the whole match. I mean, he looked like a beast. <laughs> it looked like Mox was going to lose like for 90% of this thing. But yeah, the first and second half of the match is delineated by like a cannonball on a standing Mox, like supposedly, but Mox leaves and then Brody just crashes on the turnbuckle. I don't know how you're a wrestler and then you protect yourself from this because it looks like it hurts. So then one of the candidates for spot in the match has to be what happens like right after this where Mox goes for a superplex but in order to perform the move he like bites and does back scratches <laughs> further strengthening Brody King because the champ has to resort to tactics like this. And so the second half of this match is like so much better than the first. It's a lot more hard hitting. But I do like one strike battle at the first half that I think will be in the spots of the match. It was just like so good how Mox sells this. I'm going to talk about it later. So yeah, so Brody King regains control. He does the thing that he did with Darby, like the hanging choke. But he does this from the top turnbuckle, while pulling Mox up. And so this, like, weakens Mox. It makes him, like, groggy, sit on the corner. And then Brody King finally does, like, a successful cannonball, and this looks fucking, like, devastating. This has to be, like, a signature move or something. This should finish people. Because this is so freaking impactful, even when Brody does this to himself. So yeah, so Mox's tactics change, he starts targeting the head, and then that's actually how he wins, which I'll talk about it later after the spots of the match. So for the spots of the match, so an honorable mention, is the cannonball by Brody King on nothing. <laughs> because I really like how this protects him. Like, he let himself down, giving up control doing this move, instead of Mox actually doing something active. And so number three spot in the match, it's the ending. So Mox does a paradigm shift. And then because he's too hurt to go for the pinfall, he instead goes for the choke and then ends up winning the match with the bulldog choke. So yeah, nice ending. Protects Brody King, makes him look fucking strong. Really good. It's a feint. He doesn't submit. So yeah. And then for the number two spot in the match, it has to be the chop that I talked about earlier. And this chop, it's like a hard-hitting New Japan chop, a hard-hitting Pro Resu chop, but then Mox sells this by flipping over. He like rolls on his shoulders, does a headstand, and then his legs just land on the ropes. 
this looked really nice and I like how commentary sold this. Like Jim Ross, amazing God Almighty call. And then for the number one spot in the match, it's the most devastating move. It's the cannonball right after the hanging choke. Because how this happens is that Brody King has Mox in like a sleeper hold. Mox tries to escape by pushing him to the turnbuckle. And then Brody King just gets up the top turnbuckle and then chokes Mox out. And then he does the most devastating move of the entire match. And that's the cannonball. So yeah, that's the match. It doesn't lead to anything else. Mox just celebrates and they close the show. It's kind of a missed opportunity for me. It should have been like PCC versus House of Black, but we'll get that someday. So yeah, this was the best match of the show. It's a pay-per-view undercard one. It was very hard-hitting, told a nice story. And I think it's Brody King's best match in AEW, aside from the Battle Royal. Because this one made him look really strong. Like, seriously. He also has a great moveset. There's like nice variety there and he's not like the typical boring big man. He's kind of like Lance Archer. So yeah, that's pretty much it. That's my review of this week's Dynamite. Here are my match rankings. And for me, this wasn't a very good show, like wrestling wise. Like majority of the wrestling matches here, like were just meh. They were so meh. The Wardlow versus Scorp match, meh. The Acclaimed versus the Jobbers, it wasn't really a match. It was more of a, like, segment for me. The Butcher and the Blade versus Keith Lee and Swerve, also pretty meh. It's actually my worst match of the night. The women did better. It was, like, a better women's match that we usually get. But uh, Marina Shafir, not very good in the ring still, but getting better. And then the main event kind of saved the show from being below average. But yeah, this was an average Dynamite wrestling-wise. But as for the non-wrestling segments, pretty strong actually. Christian Cage is the new MJF while MJF isn't on the show. So yeah, this was really fun. So yeah, that's my review of Dynamite. I don't know if I'll be able to do one next week because we're going to get sent to the field and I'm not going to be allowed to go home. It's a stupid fucking rule. But I'm going to try to like go home by Friday, hopefully. And that's like Thursday where you're from. But yeah, so that's my review of AEW Dynamite. Let's move on to the TV ratings. Okay, so for the TV ratings... Things are a lot better without the relevant sports. We only have MLB now and that's not important. It got a higher like total viewership than Dynamite, but Dynamite topped everything in the 18 to 49 demographic with a score of 0.36. Number two is like Real Housewives with 0.30. But yeah, the male viewers of Dynamite is just like astronomically high compared to everything else. It's like a 0.44 and number two is 0.38 while the rest are like 0.20s the female demographic isn't very bad it's actually pretty high it scored like third overall so yeah everyone's watching dynamite really good news total viewership is 979,000 sad that it's not a million anymore but the show wrestling wise wasn't that good so yeah, I hope Fighter Fest can draw like a million because it's a special event. I think it's too close to the previous special event, but yeah, that's how AEW does things. It boggles the mind sometimes. So yeah, that's my review and ratings of this week's Dynamite. I don't know when I'll be back, but yeah, thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe for engagement. Share if you don't know me. Hit that bell notification for future videos. And please... Watch my shit.